We're going to continue with astrology and astronomy and Judaism, part two. Uh, so just a quick recap. Uh, we said how we distinguished between astrology and astronomy, that astrology is more of the spiritual, mystical part, and astronomy is more of the science behind it. And we talked about the fact that we are not allowed to use astrology as Jews. We're not allowed to use astrology for fortune telling, to predict the future or anything like that. That's, that's false. And we said how Ain Mazal Israel that we don't we shouldn't follow the constellations. What we can use the astrological signs and constellations for is just to better understand ourselves and the Jewish calendar and the Torah and certain historical events, perhaps. Uh, so for that, we can use astrology, but we cannot use astrology for any kind of fortune telling because we have to have faith in God and everything happens because God wills it to happen and not because of some constellational effect on us so that there is the constellations are there they do have some kind of flow of energy that they bring into this world that's what mazal means mazal constellation in hebrew is mazal it literally means something that flows so there is some kind of flow from the heavens and we can use that to understand the world around us but not to predict the future and we said how there's of course 12 main constellations in terms for astrological purposes that make up the zodiac and we said how they correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel and to 12 permutations of God's name and to the 12 kind of major qualities of life, according to Sefer Yitzira, and to the 12 months of the Jewish calendar. So just a quick recap of, of the first one of it was the month of Nisan, which corresponds to the tribe of Yehuda, and the quality is speech. And the permutation of God's name is the, the name of God, yud heh vav -Hey. And we said how that's, of course, that all ties to Passover because the main mitzvah of Passover in ancient times was the slaughtering of the Pesach offering, right, the, the Paschal lamb. So that's basically a sheep, a ram. And Aries, the astrological sign of this month, of the month of Pesach, is a ram, a sheep, a ram. And we know that our sages, as our sages teach, that it was specifically God commanded the Israelites at that time to slaughter a ram or sheep because the Egyptians worshipped these uh, constellations as gods. They related them to their false idols, gods. And their main, their chief god, Amun-Ra, was symbolized by a ram. And so God specifically said, slaughter the rams, so that it was something appalling to the Egyptians. The whole message of the Exodus and the plagues and the miracles was to show the, the folly and silliness of idolatry and to break these, this, this false belief in these gods. So, so there's this correlation between why Pesach is in Nisan, where the constellation is Aries, the ram, the sheep, and also the other mitzvah of Passover, the, the, the other big mitzvah that we still have today is, of course, to the Haggadah, to talk about it, the Higat Levincha, that we're supposed to mitzvah from the Torah, that we have to talk about Passover, relay it to our children from generation to generation. And our sages say that Pesach is like a contraction of the words Pesach. Pe means mouth, and Sach means to speak, a discussion. So Pesach is about speech, about discussion, getting together, at the Passover Seder the table and relaying and staying up all night, late into the night, talking about the Pesach miracles and the events that took place. And again, fittingly, the quality of the month of Nisan, the quality corresponding to Aries is speech, okay, which, which in the original language in Sefer Yitzir is Sicha. So that same root as in Pesach, Sicha. And the tribe is Yehuda. Uh, Yehuda is, uh, again, fitting for the month of Nisan because Yehuda is the main Jewish tribe. We are all descendants of Yehuda specifically. And the name Yehuda actually carries God's name in it. This permutation of God's name, yud heh vav -Hey, the name of God, is within the name Yehuda. Right? If you spell Yehuda, it's yud heh vav dalad -Hey. It's like the name of God, yud heh vav -Hey, with the Dalet inside. And there, there's a lot of meaning behind that, that, that the Jew, the Yehudi carries God's name with him, right? And our own name is God's name. So that wherever we go, God is with us, that we carry God with us. So that's just one little, and we talked about most of this already last time, that that's how all these things correspond to each other, the constellation, to the months, to the quality, to the particular tribe. And then we talked about Iyar and Thoros and the tribe of Issachar and Gemini and 
and we talked about cancer and how that relates to the three weeks and being kind of like a dangerous time of the year corresponding to cancer, which is considered perhaps a dangerous sign, like the, 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 the claw of the crab. Uh, and however, there is of course also a positive thing. I think last time we focused on the negative aspects of Tammuz, of cancer, but there's also positive things, of course. Every, every sign has positive qualities and negative qualities. So on the one hand, there is this kind of danger, risk of death. There's this association with death. But on the other hand, there's also a, a strong association with, with life, with summer. This is the peak of summer. Everything is growing, blossoming. Uh, so it's associated also with a lot of energy and life and passion. And there's, there's positive things. Each quality has both positive and negative aspects to it. And again, we can use that to understand ourselves. If you're born at a particular time, you're born in this month, in a particular week, day, we discussed last time, the difference between saying Mazal Tov and Besha Tova, like the effect that, that the constellations have on us, both the particular month, but also even the, the week and day and even the hour. Uh, and we talked about the different days of the week, how they, they might affect the person's qualities. And then we went through Av and Elul, and we stopped here with Libra and Tishrei. Libra, Tishrei is the month of judgment, right? That's when we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so, of course, fittingly, the astrological sign is Libra, which is the scales of judgment. Yeah, so that we talked about as well. And we stopped here. So now we're here. So now we're starting with Cheshvan. Or continuing with Cheshvan, I should say. So Cheshvan is Scorpio. And Scorpio is considered another kind of like dangerous a uh, dangerous sign, kind of similar to cancer, the, the sting of the scorpion. And the month is Cheshvan, which traditionally we call, we call Mal Cheshvan, that it's like a bitter month, right? Because there's no holidays in the month of Cheshvan. And it's also the month, mainly what, what's commemorated in the month of Cheshvan is kind of two tragedies. One is the death of Rachel Imenu, on the 11th of Cheshvan, and the other is the flood, the biblical flood at the time of Noah, Noah that, that came, that started in the month of Cheshvan. So Cheshvan is associated with the flood. And fittingly, the, the element for the month is water, as would be expected, it's associated with the flood waters, and Scorpio being this kind of dangerous, stinging thing. And we're gonna come back to Scorpio uh, a bit later. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit now and I'm going to come back to this and why it is that it corresponds specifically to the quality of smell. What is the relationship with smell? So I'll come back to Scorpio. And then we have Sagittarius, which corresponds to Kislev, the month of Kislev, which we have in Kislev, the first part of Hanukkah. Hanukkah starts in, in Kislev. And the, fittingly, again, the sign for it is Sagittarius, which is a warrior. And Hanukkah is the basically the only holiday where we celebrate a war specifically. I mean, there's some military aspects to Purim and to Pesach as well, but Hanukkah is the only one where we're really talking about a, an actual war, you know, between two sides. And so fittingly, the constellation is this warrior, the archer, Sagittarius, and the tribe is Binyamin. Because as the Torah says, and as our sages say, Binyamin were the fiercest warriors of Israel. We see that in the Tanakh. You know, at one point, there was a civil war of all the tribes against Binyamin. And Binyamin was able to hold them off for a time. I mean, they were very powerful warriors, the tribe of Binyamin. The Torah compares them to a devouring wolf. You know, they were fierce like wolves. So the greatest fighters, the greatest warriors came from the tribe of Binyamin. And that's, again corresponding to Lady of War, Sagittarius, Hanukkah. And the quality of this time is sleep, which makes sense because this is winter time. This is the time of the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. That's the darkest time of the year. And when a lot of animals are hibernating, sleeping, so the quality associated with this time is sleep. And the element that's associated with this is fire, as we would expect. It's all about lighting the flames, Hanukkah, the menorah. We're, we're bringing light into the world. We're lighting fires, bringing light into the world at a very dark time. So that's Sagittarius. Let's be slow. And then Hanukkah carries over into the next month, which is Tevet. 
So the first part of Hanukkah is in, in the month of Kislev. And then it also carries over to the month of Tibet. And that corresponds to the tribe of Dan and to the quality of anger, or more specifically, um, kind of righteous anger. And right? we're not allowed to be angry. Anger is a quality that a Jew is not never supposed to have. Our sages say that anger is like idolatry. A person who gets angry is likened to an idol worshiper. What's the connection? Because if you're getting angry, that means that you are upset at what God is sending your way. And it's almost like you are denying uh, God's plan for you, right? God sends you a certain challenge and you're getting angry about it. It's like you're, you're, going, you're, you're disagreeing with God. It's like you're going against God. So there's this connection. It's almost like it's idol worship. That's one explanation for it. But anger is likened to idolatry and a Jew is not supposed to be angry, never supposed to be angry. Um, so what, what is allowed though is like righteous anger, right? righteous indignation. When, when a Jew sees some kind of uh, something immoral happening, right? Something inappropriate and he gets, uh, gets worked up about it and gets upset that's, that this evil is taking place, something ungodly, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good quality, right? That you, and, and to use that to make a difference, to fix it, fix the problem. There's a problem and you, you can go and you, you get upset about it and you go fix it. So that's the idea with, with anger, the quality of anger here uh, in Capricorn and Tevet. And the month of Tevet doesn't, again, doesn't have any special necessarily holidays. We have Hanukkah, which is this war against the Greeks. And then we also have the 10th of Tevet, which is a fast day, which we're commemorating a number of tragedies that happened, one of which was the translation of the Torah into Greek. And that was considered a problematic thing. Our, our sages uh, spoke about that in a, in a negative way that, that, that it would have been better for the Torah never to have been translated into Greek. And that's one of the reasons why we fast on this day. And what, what is the connection here to the Greeks? So I think this is, this is a fitting place to, to talk about the relationship between uh, the Jews and Greeks. And you find something really interesting. I put here uh, this word, which might look like gibberish, but Amaltheus cornucopia, because the sign of Capricorn, some, some people associate it with the Greek myth of Amaltheia. Some don't. Some associate that with a different constellation. Uh, but Capricorn, this, this goat, kind of like water goat, whatever it is, um, is, is known in, in Greek mythology. There's this goat called Amaltheia. And Amalthea is the goat that suckled the, the Greek god Zeus. So Zeus, when he was a baby, he was hidden because his father was out to get him. And he was hidden and uh, he was fed and suckled by this goat called Amalthea. And then if you remember the myth, he played with its horns and he was so strong, baby Zeus, that he broke off the horn. And that horn is called the cornucopia. So why do I, why am I talking about this? Because that 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 story might ring a bell if you remember the midrash about Avraham, how Avraham was born. The midrash says, that when Abraham was born. Um, in the in the stars, something strange happened, where one star appeared to swallow up other stars. And Amru Chachamim le Nimrod, the sages of the king that in Babylon at the time, Nimrod, uh, the the sages told the king, Ben uh, Nolad le Terach, that Abraham's father Terach. So Terach had a son born to him, and Atid le Tzat Mimenu Umash Etirash Olam that that this person Abraham, this child that's born from him will come, you know, a nation that's going to shake up the whole world, this world, the next world. And so they told him, let's, let's get rid of this child, right? We have to get rid of this, this child. And what did Abraham's father do? That he actually hid the baby Abraham in a cave for three years. And um, that God made a miracle and that Abraham was miraculously kept alive in this cave uh, by the angels and, and so on. So similar to the story of Zeus, uh, that somebody was after him when he was born and he was hidden in a cave. This is the same story, very similar story about Abraham, but what's the connection? The Gemara says something really interesting. It says, Imea de Havraham, the mother of Abraham, what was her name? 
Amatlai Bat Karnevo, that her name was Amatlai, which is sounds very similar to the Greek Amalthea, right? This being that uh, kept Zeus alive. Uh, so that's a really strange, and, and Karnevo, it's Amatlai Bat Karnevo, and the Rashbam comment Karnevo, the, the root of it is Karim Mitzon, that it's talking about, again, some kind of goat or you know, some, some kind of flock. It's very interesting connection between this Greek goat that suckled Zeus and that story and the Abraham story and how's that, what, what's going on here? Why, what's the connection here? And what you find is that there's many, many similarities between Greek myth and stories, our narratives from the Tanakh. And I put just a few of them here. This is not the whole list. There's many more. I just put a few here on the side. I mean, we in Hebrew, we call the Greeks Yavanim, Yavan. It comes from the Greek word Ion, Ionia, right? Which is like Eastern, the most Eastern region in, in ancient Greek times. And Yefet, the, the Greeks believe that they're kind of one of their gods and one of their ancestors is Yapetus. That's the same name as Yefet, who in our tradition, in the Torah, Yefet was the forefather of the Greeks. So the Greeks worshiped Yapetus as this god idol. But we know the truth that Yefet was just the son of Noah from whom the Greeks descended. So he was the son of Noah, but the, in Greek mythology, he became this god. And Dan, I remember the tribe of Dan here. The, the tribe of Dan is Capricorn. Dan, the Greeks believe that one of their forefathers, their, one, their main, one of their main forefathers is Danaeus. And there's, by the way, a great book called Was Achilles a Jew that I would recommend and traces the, the, according to that book, at least argues this theory that the ancient Greeks actually came from the ancient Israelites, or at least a group of ancient Israelites from the tribe of Dan specifically went to Greece. And, and this, the, this tribe of Dan is mentioned in Greek text in, in the Iliad, in, in the Odyssey, right? In Homer's stories in the Trojan War, it mentions the Danans, this, the tribe of Dan, this kind of that, that plays a role in Greek myth. So interesting book was Achilles a Jew and gives many other examples of how uh, ancient Israelite ideas, Jewish ideas went to Greece and inspired Greece. Another good book is uh, The Eighth Day by Samuel Kerinsky, which also points out some incre incredible things, you know, like architectural columns that we associate with the Greek construction were found in Israel before predating Greek architecture. So those types of columns actually originated apparently in Israel, seemingly. We have evidence to suggest that the Greeks actually took so much from ancient Israel, including their alphabet. The Greek alphabet came from originally from the Hebrew alphabet okay, by way of Phoenicia, by way of the Phoenicians. Yeah. The Greek alphabet came from the Hebrew alphabet. You can look it up. Uh, so a, a lot of, much of Greek myth and story and ideas came from the Jews. Uh, we all know Pythagoras. Pythagoras, you remember him from the Pythagorean theorem, but the, the story of Pythagoras is that he went on this journey around the world to Egypt, to the Middle East. He spent time probably in Israel. He met Jews, interacted with various peoples along the way. When he came back to Greece, he, he started his own kind of religion, was very spiritual. They believed in reincarnation and souls and things like that. So a lot of like Greek ideas, for example, that Pythagoras taught, where did he get those ideas? He got them from his travels through the Middle East and his perhaps also his encounters with, with Jews. Uh, one of the later Greek philosophers, Numenius, said something like, what is Plato? but Moses speaking Greek. You know, that Plato is really just paraphrasing things that Moses already taught us centuries before in the Torah, uh, bringing those ideas, introducing them to the Greek world. If you look at, if you study Tanakh, if you study, let's say, Ecclesiastes, all these kind of, we have philosophical books, Mishle, the works of King Solomon, all so much philosophy in there that in later times, the Greeks started talking about, and we in the West, we associate these ideas with the Greeks, but really they came from the Torah, they came from the Tanakh. And a lot of the Greek myths also were based on stories that appeared in the Tanakh long before. So for example, the story of Iftah, uh, which uh, if, if in the Tanakh, you're, if you remember the story of Iftah, he was one of the judges of Israel, and he made a mistake in vowing to sacrifice whatever came out, whatever greeted him first, 
uh, when he would come back from a victorious battle. And it turned out that after he won the war, the first thing that greeted him, the first person that greeted him was his own daughter. And so he, that put him in a conundrum. Like, so, you, so there's different, uh, it's not clear what happened to the daughter. There are different opinions, whether he actually went ahead and sacrificed her or whether he just uh, had her put in a, basically in like a monastery or something for the rest of her life. But the, this idea of sacrificing a daughter for military victory, the same story is found in the Trojan War story with the King Agamemnon and his daughter Iphigenia, that he sacrificed his daughter in order to have victory. You know, he sacrificed his daughter to the gods in order to be victorious in this war. The story of, of Gideon in the Torah, and again, one of the judges, one of the Shoftim, that uh, Gideon fought with 300 men against this massive force of Midianite soldiers, of hundreds of thousands of Midianites, and was able to hold them off. It's basically the same story as the story of the Battle of Thermopylae with the Spartans and Leonidas with his 300 men holding off, uh, at least for a little while, the, the Persians at Thermopylae. Same story, pretty much. I mean, same elements. And the stories of Shimshon and Hercules, Samson wrestling a lion. And Hercules, one of his tests was wrestling a lion. And so uh, very similar elements, right? Shimshon being like this... Um, special child herald, heralded by an angel and Hercules being this demigod, you know, special half man, half god. So this is just a few examples and there's many, many others. I'll actually, I'll mention a couple more later, I think. Uh, so we see that so much of, of Greek myth was based on, and Greek ideas were actually based on Torah ideas. And the, the reason I wanted to mention this is because we're talking about constellations here, Mazalot, and we associate this with kind of like Greek wisdom, Greek astronomy. A lot of these constellations came from the Greeks, so uh, at, at least that's what we think. But in reality, it's to recognize that even the Greeks got it originally from us, okay, or, or at least partly from us, that it's still based on uh, more ancient spiritual ideas that it's not all pagan necessarily, right? We might make the mistake thinking that this is all like pagan Greek stuff, but even the pagan Greeks got so much of their ideas and stories were based on ours, our own, based on Jewish stories and ideas from the Tanakh. That, that's the idea here. And, and, I'll, and we'll see a little bit more of that later on. Okay, moving, moving on to Aquarius. Okay, so that's Shvat. Uh, corresponds to the tribe of Asher and Taste. And Shvat has, we have the holiday of Tubi Shvat, which is about, you know, the main thing is on Tubi Shvat, as is customary, is to have like a little Tubi Shvat Seder and to taste as many different types of fruits as possible. It's kind of like the start of the new farming season. And aquarium, Aquarius is fitting because it's about bringing water. That's what Aquarius is it's the water bringer, the water pourer, the water bearer. So, it's we're starting to irrigate the fields again in preparation for a new farming season. It's it's the new year for trees, as we say, right? Like Rosh Hashanah Leilanot. It's a new year for the agricultural season. And so it's fitting that we have taste and we have the idea of irrigation of water. Uh, so that's that. And I'll, I'll come back to Aquarius as well. And finally, we're at the month of Adar, the last month of the year, which is Pisces, which is Naphtali, which is laughter. Laughter, of course, joy, a happy time. And as we know, Misha Nichna Sadar, Marbim Basimcha, right? That when Adar begins, Adar is considered the happiest month of the Jewish calendar. And fittingly, the quality of that month is joy and laughter and happiness. And Pisces is always, always in, in pretty much all cultures, is considered kind of like a lucky sign, lucky fish. And the Gemara tells us that fish are special because that Ainara, that the evil eye doesn't affect them because they're like, they're immersed in water all the time. And, and so they're protected from the evil eye. So the fish has this quality of almost like protection from, from evil. And it's considered a, a, like a lucky sign, a lucky month, a happy month. So that's Adar. And of course, the water sign, you know, fish. Uh, so it's the time of joy. So that's, that's like a quick overview. There's a lot more to say, but just a quick overview of the 12 signs and the 12 months and the 12 tribes and the 12 qualities. And I wanna add a few things to this. Uh, first of all, just to show how so much of this is in the Tanakh, we already saw a bunch of things from the Tanakh about the constellations. And I wanna show you some more that 
Um, if you remember Ezekiel's vision, the first chapter of the of Yechezkel, where the prophet Ezekiel sees this incredible vision and he describes in detail the chariots, so, so to speak, of God and the angels and so on. In art, it's been done throughout history many times in different paintings and artworks. And this is my favorite one by Simon Wong, like a beautiful artist's rendition of what Yechezkel saw. It's really hard to decipher what he saw. But one thing that we know that he saw, he saw the angels and he describes the angels like this. He says, the angels have an appearance of four different kind of faces. Uh, Demut Pneum, that their faces, they have four faces. <clears throat> Pnei Adam, the face of a man. Pnei Arie, the face of a lion. El Hayamin L'Arbatam, Pnei Shor Me'asmol. So on the left side was the face of a bull, Shor. And then Pnei Nesher, the sign of a eagle on the back. Okay, so they had the face of a man, uh, a, a lion on the right, and uh, a bull on the left, and an eagle, a nesher, actually more accurately to translate as a vulture, a nesher is a vulture on the back. Okay, so for what, and maybe that, that should perhaps uh, light a, uh, turn on the light bulb because we looked at the zodiac, the four main signs of the zodiac, are um, the, the lion, Leo, and Tauros, and Aquarius, Dli, and the Akrav. So you have the face of a person, of, of a man, Adam, which is Aquarius, the Dli. And you have the, the face of a shor, of a bull. And you have the face of an Arie. And the last one, where Ezekiel calls a Nesher, um, we, we have a Akrav, but it's, it should be mentioned that in certain cultures, the Scorpio constellation is actually known as the Eagle constellation as well, or a vulture or an Eagle constellation. So that's another alternate identification of the, the, the star shapes. Uh, so the, the faces that Ezekiel saw in the angels actually corresponds to the fixed signs, the zodiac. And it says in Tehilim that what Ezekiel saw was not just like a one-time thing, that these kinds of chariots of God and these angels are everywhere, and that God has thousands of them. What does that mean, alfei shinan? So according to one interpretation of our sages, that there's 22,000 chariots like this with angels like this that God rides with. And the Zohar takes another approach to al Shinan. What does it mean? And connects, puts this all together. So it says like this, the Zohar, that Malachi Elohim, Chesar, that there's, there's 12 main angels. There are many angels out there. Uh, and we'll talk more about that soon. But there are 12 main angels of God. And their names are, here's the list, Michael, we've all heard of Michael, Kadmiel, Padael, Gabriel, Tzidkiel, all these different angels of God, Raphael, Raziel. So there's 12 main angels, Yofiel, Anael, and Alfei um, Shinan, what does that mean? Why are the angels called Alfei Shinan? That Shinan is an acronym for Shor, Nesher, Ariyeh, and Nun Sufit is Adam. So throughout the Zohar, the Nun Sufit always represents, is symbolic of man, is the shape of kind of like a, a man, a standing man, an upright man. So the Zohar says that the, the, these words in Tehilim that talk about the angels of God as being Alfei Shinan, that Shinan stands for these four fixed signs of the Zodiac, because each of these angels has four faces, like Ezekiel said, right? They have the face of a man, of a bull, of a lion, of an eagle. Okay, so that's the real meaning of Alfei Shinan. But one thing to, that's important to remember that the Zohar, uh, again, emphasizes here that all of them are under, of course, God's supervision. Uh, so Hashem shalta al kola, that God rules over all of them. So we shouldn't think that these angels have any kind of independence or power of their own. They are only messengers of God, emissaries of God. They only do God's will. They have no independent power. So we are totally forbidden from... God forbid worshiping them or even praying to them. Right? It's forbidden to even pray to angels. We don't pray to angels. We only pray to God. Right? God rules all of them. These are just God's emissaries. 
um, God's messengers in the universe. So that's the idea that God rules Shalta al God rules all of them. They are like God's entourage, let's say. They're his, they, they surround God's chariot. They, they always appear around God's presence. These 12 main angels, which correspond to the 12 constellations, to the 12 Masalot. Okay, we're going to go further down this topic and into something even more complex, which is the procession of the equinoxes. Something that we talked about briefly before. Um, we're going to talk about it in fuller now. Uh, we saw this image earlier, this uh, Galgala Mazalot, this cosmic wheel. This is from like a 12th or 13th century diagram. And this is a more modern diagram. There's a 26,000 year cycle, cosmic cycle, called the precession of the equinoxes. What it means is the equinoxes, when day and night are roughly the same length, so it happens twice a year. There's a spring equinox, which is always around March 20th, and the fall, the autumn equinox, which is at the end of September. Uh, so we're focusing here on the spring equinox when summer and I mean, when uh, day and night are roughly 12 hours each. And at that time, uh, the sun, basically like the center of the sun will be right in line with Earth's equator. And what, what this connects, this ties into the constellations because where the sun appears in the sky relative to the, to the constellation, basically that appears behind it, uh, that's kind of the ruling constellation in this period of time. So there's this astrological age and it's a 26,000 year cycle and you get just over 2000 years per uh, constellation that rules for this 2000 year period. So for this 2000 year period, the equinox will always take place. The sun will always appear in that constellation. So. Uh, for the past 2,000 years, it's been the age of Pisces. So every spring equinox, if you were to look at the sun in the, in the sky, that's particularly at the equator, it would, it would be, its position would be in the constellation Pisces. So for the past 2,000 years, it's been in Pisces. But there's a procession of the equinoxes. The, it, the sky is changing, not that the sky is changing, the earth is changing because the earth is rotating on a 23 degree axis. And as it rotates over time, the axis is always 23 degrees, but earth is moving, like it's tilt, it's shifting. It's like, you can imagine it's something like when you spin a dreidel, you have a sevivon, you spin a sevivon. And at first it's probably upright as it spins, it's upright, but then what happens as it gets towards the end, it starts to wobble, right? As it's spinning, it's still spinning really quickly, but it's wobbling back and forth. You know what I'm talking about? So it's, that's what's similar to what's happening with the earth, that it's rotating, but it's also wobbling back and forth. And so the night sky will appear to shift over time. And that shift takes 26,000 years, that wobble, takes place over about 26,000 years. So why is this important? Because right now we are transitioning into this age, new age, the age of Aquarius. And why is this important? Aquarius, remember, is representative of filling the world with water. And the prophet Ishayahu Isaiah says that in the time of Mashiach, in the end of days, what's going to happen? That that Hashem kamaim layam echasim, that the world will be full of wisdom of God, like the oceans are full of water. There's going to be like a flow of, as if a flood of wisdom into the world before Mashiach comes. And the Zohar famously has this beautiful prophecy. The Zohar says this, so remember, just to put things in context, the Zohar was first published in the 13th century. I mean, it dates back much longer to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai almost 2,000 years ago, but it was first published, put out to the public in the 13th century. And the Zohar says, Uveshit mea shanin lishtita, that in the sixth century of the sixth millennium, in the Jewish year, of course, so in the year 50. Sixth century of this, we're right now in the year 57 
81, in the sixth century of the sixth millennium, that the gates of wisdom above, of the supernal wisdom will open. And also the chokhmat letata of the wisdom below will open, the itztakan alma, that the world will be prepared, will be fixed to prepare for the seventh millennium, the final millennium, the messianic age. And it's based on, the Zohar says, it's based on the fact that of, of Noah, the flood of Noah, because when Noah, the Torah tells that in the shnat shesh me'ot shana lechaye Noah, in the 600th year of, in the time of Noah, of Noah's life, that all these well springs of water opened up. So the Zohar says, just like it happened with Noah, now again, there will be a flood of wisdom into the world. In the sixth, starting in the sixth century of the sixth millennium, the world will be flooded with wisdom to prepare for the Messianic age. And this is one of the most beautiful prophecies of the Zohar that we have seen fulfilled in history. Because if you look at the sixth century of the sixth millennium that corresponds to the years 1740 to 1840 which is precisely the time of the industrial revolution the peak of the enlightenment this is when all the kind of major technologies that transform the world were invented the first electrical devices the light and jar the battery you know volta this is the time this is when the first light bulbs the first arc lighting and the steam engine and and in terms of science, some of the biggest theories, this is when Darwin was active, when chemistry was born, you know, chemistry really took off with electricity. Once we had batteries and we can use electricity, scientists started using electricity to split molecules, split compounds, isolate elements, put together the periodic table. So this century from 1740 to 1840 was really the foundation of the modern world. And the world was just flooded with wisdom and the Zohar says both from below and from above. So the wisdom from below is the scientific wisdom, earthly wisdom, but also wisdom from above, spiritual wisdom, mystical wisdom. That's when Kabbalah started to open up and spread. This is when the Hasidic movement took off, right? It's the time of the Baal Shem Tov and the Altar Rebbe and all these other great names in, in, in Judaism and Jewish mysticism. This is the time when it started to spread specifically. Jew, Jewish mysticism was always vibrant for centuries, but in from 1740 onwards, 1840, this was the time uh, when all this information flooded the world and started to spread. Also the Zionist movement, uh, the person, it's a little known fact that the person, the really the spiritual force behind the Zionist movement was Rabbi Yehuda Alkali, who, Sephardi rabbi, uh, who wrote a book. They, and he based this on the Zohar. He, he knew this prophecy in the Zohar. And he said that now is the time to come back to Israel. Now we have this, the heavens have opened up and the potential is there for Jews to return to Israel. He specifically referred to this Zohar prophecy. And he wrote a book called Goral Le'ashem that outlined, basically it was like a Zionist manifesto. It wasn't called Zionist yet because it wasn't like officially the Zionist movement. But in this book, he wrote what needs to be done. The Jews need to go back to Israel, purchase land from the Ottomans bit by bit make agricultural colonies, start speaking in Hebrew. We need to reunite all the Jews from Ashkenaz, from Sfarad, from everybody, and our common language is Hebrew. So we have to resurrect Hebrew as our spoken language so that we can all understand each other for obvious reasons, because the Ladino speaking Jews don't understand the Yiddish speaking Jews and the Bukharians don't understand these. Everybody has their own la uh, Jewish language in exile. So it's, what's the one language that unites us? Hebrew. All right, so Rabbi Yehuda Alkali wrote this book, Go Al Hashem, where he laid out how we're going to bring back and restore Israel. And the incredible thing is, is that one of his friends and one of his congregants in his shul was uh, Simon Leib Herzl, who got one of the first editions of that book from the rabbi. And Theodore Herzl got that book from his grandfather, Simon Leib Herzl. And so many scholars agree that most of Herzl's ideas actually came from Rabbi Yehuda Alkali, and that, that was the book that really inspired him and gave him that vision that what eventually became the Zionist movement. Uh, but I mentioned that here because, again, Rabbi Yehuda Alkali did that based on this prophecy of the Zohar that said that this is the time, the sixth century of the sixth millennium, this is the time to prepare for the Messianic age. And the idea of moving into the age of Aquarius, that the world is filling up, just like the Zohar says, like the Torah says, like Ishayahu says, 
that the well springs are opening up. It's the time of Aquarius, the time of water flowing into the world, spiritual waters from above and below. And with that, there is a 13th zodiac, zodiac sign, the 13th mazal, the 13th constellation, which has kind of been forgotten, but it's there. There's a 13th constellation called Ophiuchus or Serpentarius. And it sits between, here's the ecliptic line. We said last time that this is where all the, the, the zodiac constellations are on this line. And you can see that Ophiuchus is uh, between where uh, the Scorpio uh, constellation is. And there's another constellation here called Serpent. And this constellation, as the sky is shifting, this constellation is becoming more prominent in the sky as we shift to the age of Aquarius. And why is that important? Why is Ophiuchus important? Ophiuchus is literally, it's the snake holder, Serpentarius. You can see the image is a, a man holding, grasping a snake. Uh, Ophiuchus is holding the serpent's constellation and trampling and stepping on the Scorpio constellation. And this appears at the end of Cheshvan. So I said I would come back to Cheshvan. And Ophiuchus is between Cheshvan and Kislev, between Scorpio and Sagittarius. And he is wrestling down the snake and stepping on the scorpion. What is the meaning behind this? Why is this important that he's grasping a snake and stepping on a scorpion? So remember we said that uh, Cheshvan is called Mal Cheshvan. It's called a bitter month because the flood happened in that month. Uh, Rachel Imenu died in that month. There's no happy holidays in that month. And within, within the name Cheshvan is the letters Nachash, that this is, represents the primordial serpent that seeks to hurt us, that's associated with evil, with the Yetzirah. And what's amazing is that the Book of Jubilees, which is one of these ancient books we talked about the last time, actually says something incredible that uh, it was in the month of Cheshvan that the Nachash Bechodesh Hashini, the Shiva Sarbo, on the 17th of Cheshvan, that Ve'yavo uh, Nachash Ve'ikarev Elaisha, that's talking about in the Garden of Eden, that that incident with Eve and the snake happened in the month of Cheshvan. That's also one of the secrets of why the letters of Cheshvan, Nachash is in the name Cheshvan. Of course, in rabbinic tradition, generally we say that it all, it all happened like on the sixth day, uh, but this is chronologically perhaps is a little bit makes a little bit more sense that not the rabbinic tradition is that the consumption of the forbidden fruit and the snake all happened on the first of Tishrei, which is the day that the same day that Adam and Eve were created, they part, partook of the fruit. But according to the book of Jubilees, it didn't all happen right away. There was some time elapsed and it happened in the, the month of Cheshvan, which, which is kind of a little bit more logical right? that it didn't all just happen so quickly that there was a little bit of time elapsed. And it happened in the month of Cheshvan. And that's why Cheshvan is the bitter Cheshvan, Mal Cheshvan. That's why the Nachash is in Cheshvan. And in the Torah, we read God, well, Moses is saying in Varim, that the two kind of metaphorically, the two things that in the wilderness for the Jewish people, the two big obstacles were, the two kind of big obstacles for the Jewish people was the Nachash Saraf, which was a venomous snake, the Akrav, and the scorpion, okay, the Tzimaon, and thirst. But the two kind of big entities that stood in the way of the Jewish people that God led us through and saved us from, what? Nachash Saraf, a venomous snake, and a scorpion. What is the meaning of the snake and scorpion? The snake and scorpion, according to our sages, represent two venomous creatures. And what is the difference between these two venomous creatures? So Hazal say that the Nahash, the venom of the snake is a hot venom. It's a burning venom. The venom of a scorpion is a cold venom. That's how they describe it. That the scorpion's venom is cold and the snake's venom is hot. Spiritually, what that means is the Yetzarara, you know, evil, the evil inclination has two ways of harming us, of trying to get us to do bad things. And the way that it works is either through the Nahash method or through the Akrav method. Either it's going to be like the Nahash, like the hot venom that turns you on, that lights a flame, that burns you to commit sin, or it's going to be like the cold venom, the akrav, which cools you down. You want to do a mitzvah, you want to do something good, and the akrav bites you and stops you. 
And there's two ways for the side, the evil side, the sitra acha, to affect human beings. It's either by lighting the flame, by injecting a hot venom to, to cause a person to sin, or by injecting a cold venom to cool somebody off and to prevent them from doing good things, to stop them from doing mitzvahs. These are the two tools of the side of evil. And so the, the purpose of Mashiach ultimately is to destroy evil. In the messianic age, evil will be destroyed. And so the venom of the snake and the scorpion needs to be neutralized. And so Fiukis is that being that is wrestling down the snake and stomping on the scorpion. It's the constellation of Mashiach. It represents Mashiach. And it's in the time of Cheshvan, right? So it's wedged in Cheshvan. So interestingly, Ibn Yisachar says that specifically Mashiach will be crowned and the temple will be rebuilt or rededicated. That specifically in the month of Cheshvan is when we should expect uh, Mashiach to, the, the, pro, the messianic process to be concluded. So that's the time of, of destroying the kind of that the sim symbolism of the evil of the snake and the scorpion, okay, of the venom of the snake and the scorpion. And that brings us back to why the, the, the sense of Hashvan is the sense of smell. What's the connection to the sense of smell? Because we're saying that this is the time of, this is Mashiach's constellation. And our sages tell us that Mashiach's superpower, so to speak, is the sense of smell that Mashiach will smell, will judge people through his smell. He will be able to smell a person and know basically everything about them. How do we know? From the prophet Ishayahu, that Ishayahu Isaiah describes who Mashiach will be, and he says, that he will have the spirit of God, and this, he will be wise and understanding, and so on. And, and the Isaiah then says, that that he, what this word is, va'aricho is an interesting word that's hard to define. So our sages say that it means reicho, that reach, that he will smell ve'irat Hashem, that he will smell through his fear of God, he will smell through his godliness, and uh, he will judge people through the sense of smell. Because again, Isaiah says that Mashiach will not judge lo right? He will not judge by what he sees, he will judge by his sense of smell. Somehow that's his power. Mashiach's power is a sense of smell. And the sense of smell is something really special. Um, talking scientifically right now, there's something really interesting about the sense of smell that anatomically, the sense of smell is basically almost insignificant, right? It's a small part of your body. The part of your brain that deals with smell, the olfactory bulb is a tiny little, little bulb in the brain, tiny little thing almost nothing. Whereas let's say your eyes make up a huge part, visual processing makes up a huge part of your brain, a huge part of your energy intake, something like 5% of all your energy that you consume goes just to power your eyes, your visual system. So other senses take a lot of your anatomically are very significant, take big chunks of your brain and big chunks of your energy, but the sense of smell doesn't, it seems to be very minimal and insignificant. But genetically, the sense of smell is, is the most prominent. So in terms of our genes, human beings have something like 22,000 genes, depending on who you are. There's no consensus. It's something between, depending on how you define the gene, there's 20 to 25,000 genes. The largest gene family codes for your sense of smell. More than anything else, your body codes for smell. There are more genes for smell than anything, anything, than anything else. It's the largest gene family far as I know. So the sense of smell, something incredible, that you have more genes to help you smell than anything else. And we know the power of smell, you know, like we hu humans don't have such a strong sense of smell, but dogs, let's say, can smell things miles away. Dogs can smell if a person has cancer. Dogs have been trained to smell a person's blood sugar. You can look this up. A dog can be trained to tell a diabetic if their blood sugar is high or low, like so that they don't have to prick for, for children specifically, so they don't have to prick themselves all the time and do the blood test. You can actually train a dog to smell you and the dog can smell your blood sugar. That's incredible. So there's so much information in the sense of smell that we humans, it's not, smell is not so such a big thing for us, but it could be, right? There's this hidden power 
in the sense of smell. We have like a thousand genes for it, right? So, so Mashiach, our sages say, will have that sense of smell, that he'll be able to smell things down to their, you know, to every, we'll be able to define everything and understand everything through the sense of smell. He will unlock the sense of smell. There's something really important about smell. So that ties to why Cheshvan is smell and the constellation of Yuhus and Mashiach and serpent and Scorpio. We're, we're done with the Zodiac, but we said that there's 88 constellations total and a few others are really important. A few other constellations are really significant and are mentioned in the Tanakh. So they're worth talking about. Orion is one of them. You know, when you step outside, probably the first thing that you see, if you look up in the sky, you probably see Orion. You can't miss it. Like you, it's right there, especially Orion's belt. If you step outside tonight and the first, probably the first thing you'll see Usually the first thing I see when I step out and I look up, I see Orion's belt, three really prominent bright stars in the sky, three or three stars of Orion's belt. And they're part of the whole Orion, who's considered like the great hunter Orion. And it's mentioned in, uh, in the Tanakh. Uh, for example, Iov says that God, and the commentary there, most of the commentaries say the same thing. This is from Mitzidat David that Aish Ksil Vechima Shmot Mazalot. These are names of constellations. And I'll talk about the other ones in a moment. So Orion is one of these constellations that Eov mentions. And we talked about the Greek connection. Right? What was Orion in Greek mythology? It's another one of these things that's based on a, our Torah. It's a Torah story that was taken and adapted into a Greek myth. Because if you remember the story of Orion, Orion's birth, that his parents were infertile and really wanted a child and couldn't have a child. And the three gods, Zeus and Poseidon and Hermes came to the parents and, and blessed them to have a child. And that child was the great hunter Orion. So that's the exact same story as Yitzhak Avinu, right? That Avram and Sarah wanted a child, couldn't have a child. And then three angels came, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, came to them. And of course announced that, it's, that they would have a child and Yitzhak was born. And so it's the same story. So Orion, the story of Orion was really adapted from the Torah story of Yitzhak and the three angels that came to him. So when you look up at Orion's belt, the three main stars of Orion, you can think of the three main angels in the Torah, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, that came to herald the birth of Yitzhak. Now, Orion is, is really interesting because there's something called the Orion correlation theory. And there's this popular theory that the pyramids, these mysterious ancient things that nobody really knows how they were built and exactly when and what they were for necessarily, that they seem to align very neatly with Orion, the, pyramid, the great pyramids of Giza. And in, uh, in Mesopotamia, in ancient times, Orion was actually called Nephila. So if you know the Nephilim, remember the story of the Nephilim in the Torah, in Bereshit, chapter 6, verse 4, the Nephilim were like the fallen angels, something to do with fallen angels. I'll leave that to you to research. Uh, do we have time? For I'll talk about this really briefly. Um, the Sphinx, which sits in front of the pyramids, is, is even more mysterious, perhaps, than the pyramids, because the Sphinx appears to be even older. We have no idea when it was built. It looks like it's been eroded by flowing water, and it has so many layers that some people, not accepted by mainstream science because it's so bizarre, but some people think that this thing is a, at least 10,000 years old maybe 12,000 years old. And the Sphinx is in the shape of a line, of course. And so some, there's this idea that the Sphinx was built during the age of Leo. So remember we talked about these cosmic ages of 20, so this 26,000 year cycle. So the past 2000 years were the age of Pisces. And before that was the age of Aries, 2000 years before that. And if you keep going back, uh, at that time, 10 to 12,000 years ago or so, that would have been the age of Leo. So the idea is that the pyramids and the Sphinx were built at this time, aligned with Orion, and the Sphinx was supposed to represent the age of Leo at that time. And I think this goes back to the idea of 
the cosmic Shemitot. So I want to talk about this because we're talking about a 26,000 year cycle. So that again brings to mind the question of how do we deal with that and the fact that the Jewish year is 5781. So we already addressed that when we talked about Torah and science in part one there, how we deal with time. Uh, but I want to talk about the cosmic Shemitot again. Remember this idea of a Shemitah, that we have a sabbatical year, right? The Torah tells us that every seventh year, we have a, a year of Shabbat, right? Every seventh day, we have a Sabbath day. And every seventh year, we have a Sabbath year. And in Kabbalistic texts that go back thousands of years, some of the earliest Kabbalistic texts, like Sefer Tmuna, there's this idea of even greater cosmic Shemitot, that there's a 7,000-year cycle of civilization and that God kind of re restarts civilization every 7,000 years. So we're in the year 5781, but we're not the first Shemitah necessarily. And so according to different texts, we might be in the second Shemitah or perhaps in the fifth, maybe in the seventh even, but there were other 7,000 year cycles of human civilization that come and go. And I think the, the evidence suggests that we are in the second Shemitah. I, feel, I think the consensus is that among most of the sources is that we're in the second Shemitah. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And Rabbi Arya Kaplan talks about this more. If you want to read his books, like his book, Kabbalah in the Age of the Universe, he talks about this. He brings all the different ideas and why. So the idea that we're in the second Shemitah fits really neatly with this because archaeologists when they dig and they find stuff we haven't found any evidence of complex civilization before 12,000 years ago so the earliest bits the earliest pieces of evidence for any kind of like building cities towns villages technology perhaps the sphinx they don't go back more than 12,000 years before that we might have some cave paintings or whatever but no complex civilization so it looks like civilization goes back to perhaps up to 12,000 years. So if we were in the second Shemitah, that fits perfectly because you had 7,000 years and now we're in 5781 of the second Shemitah. So that makes it really like 12,781, which just fits with the archeological record really nicely. And the Midrash says, by the way, that before God created this world, it's a very famous Midrash that God was creating and destroying Ayaboneu Machri Volamot that God was creating and destroying other worlds before this one. And some say that's the secret of Bereshit, that in the beginning of the Torah, what does it say? Ve'ha'aretz aita tohu vavo, right? Ve'choshech al pnei tohum. Tohum. Ve'ruach Elohim erechavet al pnei amayim. That the Torah says that the world was chaotic, tohu vavo, that there was darkness upon the deep, that there was water. So some of the commentaries say, wait, that implies that something already existed, that there was already something. So there was previous worlds that were destroyed. And then out of the chaos of other old civilizations, new God created a new thing. God hit reset and started again. It's a wild kind of idea uh, that's hard to think about. You know, it's not something that you hear about very often, very deep mystical secret, but I think it explains a lot of things. And I'll add just one, one more detail here. The reason that I like the, the opinion that we're in the second Shemitah is because each Shemitah has its quality uh, corresponding to the Kabbalistic Sfirot that we talked about. So the first Sfirah is Chesed, the second is Gvura, if you remember, then Tiferet. So if we're in the second Shemitah, those opinions that say we're in the second Shemitah, they say we're in the Shemitah of Gvura. Gvura is Din. And so the Torah is the same. The Torah is eternal. But in each Shemitah, the Torah would be expressed differently, you know, but it's the same Torah, the same eternal Torah, but expressed differently in each cycle. So because we're in the second cycle, in the cycle of Din and Gvura, the Torah expresses itself in terms of Din and Gvura. And Din is judgment. Din is law. Din is ritual. Right? So in our iteration of the Torah now, Judaism is very heavily focused on halacha, right? on law and ritual. And so the Kabbalistic explanation for that is because in this Shemitah, that's the focus. That's how the Torah is rectified and expressed in this current Shemitah. Because we're in the Shemitah corresponding to Gvura and Din. So it's the realm of Allah. So the way that Judaism is in this cycle is very Allah. And perhaps in previous cycles, maybe it was different. Maybe in the first Shemitah, the Torah was expressed more in Chesed. In the next one, it'll be more in Tiferet, whatever that means. 
that's also part of it. So I think this the, this idea of cosmic shmitot is it's it's actually a legitimate Jewish idea. It's not some like far out like new age theory. It's something that's been discussed hundreds of years ago by our own sages in Sefer Tmuna, by Rabbi Tzak Man Ako, Rabbi Arya Kaplan did a whole detailed analysis of this. It's in, it's discussed in, in many places, and it just fits well with the astrology, and cosmology and archaeology and the science it all just works together really beautifully so that's why i wanted to mention it okay uh almost done so uh eov job also said uh, so actually this was not job didn't say this god said this to job if you remember eov job was very angry at god and then God revealed himself to Eov and said, question him, gave him 50 questions. Because he said, like, who are you to, to question me? Do you know my plan? It's where were you when I created the world? Right? You're just a human. You don't understand my master plan. And one of the questions that God asked Job is, um, are you the one that can put that you can adorn the constellation Kima? Or will you? Uh, can you open the belt of Orion? Okay, so the idea of Orion's belt. So God asked Job, are you like me? Are you, can you open Orion's belt? Can you adorn uh, the Pleiades constellation? So the Pleiades is known as the seven sisters. That's what the Ibn Ezra actually says here, that they're the seven small stars of the constellation Pleiades, the famous seven sisters. And so God questioned Job. He said, are you able to adorn the seven sisters, these seven stars? Of course not. And the Gemara says something amazing on this, that uh, when God wanted to bring the flood, Noah, in the time of Noah, when he brought the flood to the world, how did he bring the flood? The flood is one of these incredible events that we can't understand. It's really hard for us to understand with our physical kind of scientific mind, how could this have happened? But it's important to understand that this was not an earthly event, that this was a cosmic event. And the Gemara says that when God wanted to bring the flood, Natal Mikima, that he brought, he somehow used two stars from Kima, from the Pleiades constellation, the Hevimabu Laulam. And from that, he brought the flood. This was a cosmic thing. God brought the flood using the Pleiades constellation. So this was a cosmic event. Perhaps it has something to do with um, ice-filled comets that are full of water in outer space. You know, the scientific consensus is that the water on Earth did not originate on Earth. That Earth's water, all of Earth's water, came here from outer space. That ice comets collided with the Earth and brought water here. That's the scientific consensus. So perhaps if the flood was... Uh, was very similar. Perhaps God brought ice comets from, from Pleiades. Who knows? I don't know what this means, but the Gemara tells us that God used two stars from the Pleiades constellation to bring the flood. And then, uh, Lesitma, when he wanted to end the flood, what did he do? Natal Vesitma, that he brought two stars. He used two stars from Aish, which is, or Ash, which is the constellation Ursa Major, the big bear which is also mentioned in Job in Eov. And it's another one that you can see very clearly when you step outside, you can see the Big Dipper, right? The Big Dipper is just an asterism. It's a section of Ursa Major. It's one chunk of Ursa Major. That's the Big Dipper. We've all heard of the Big Dipper and it's very easy to see when you step outside, you can usually kind of like you see Orion's belt and you see the Big Dipper. They're very clear, very bright, even on a, when there's a lot of light pollution outside. And if you're in a very bright spot, these are the stars that you can usually see so that's Ursa Major, really important. Again, that God used two stars from this to bring or to end the flood. And just as a, as a tip, and I'm almost done, as a tip, uh, you can always see the Big Dipper. And if you're ever out in uh, camping or something and you wanted to orient yourself and to know where north is, I've done this before, you know, if you want to pray the Mariv at night and you're not sure, you want to pray Arvit and you're not sure how to face Israel, and you're camping up north and you don't have perception, so you can't use your phone. So you look, you see where the Big Dipper is, and then you just use kind of like this edge of the ladle. You just move it all the way to the end and you find Polaris, which is the tip of the Little Dipper. 
it's very easy to find. Like once you do this once, you'll always see this like automatically when you look outside and Polaris is the North star. So that points you to North all the time. Okay, so you'll know where North is. Polaris is aligned with Earth's axis for now, but it's moving with the precession of the equinoxes. But we're aligned with Polaris. And if you ever wanted to know if the Earth is really spinning, you can set up your camera facing Polar Polaris at night and leave it on long exposure, leave your camera on for a few hours and then check the photo, it'll look like this because as the earth is rotating, the sky, the stars will kind of move across the sky and you'll get a nice image like this, okay? Just proof that the earth is rotating and a way to find north wherever you are. So that's, that's good to know about Ursa Major. Uh, I wanna talk about Nardinur, I don't, even, don't know if I have time. Nardinur is called the river of fire. That's how in the Torah and in the Gemara, that's how we refer to the Milky Way. The Milky Way is called the river of fire. And uh, it's mentioned in the book of Daniel, Nardinur. And the Gemara says that Uktsa de Akrava de Manach ben Nardinur, that the tail of the, the, the biting, the stinging tail of Scorpio is in the middle of Nardinur. So of course, uh, that's where you see Scorpio the tail of Scorpio is right in the middle of the Milky Way of Nahar Dinu. And it's important because the Talmud tells us that this is associated with the angels. That angels are formed every day. Over here in the Milky Way, they're being formed. And it's like they sing songs to God, and then they disappear. You know? So there's constantly like angels being created over there in Nahar Dinu. And this is the meaning of Elef Alfin Isham Shunea. That's what Daniel in the verse here said. So there's thousands and thousands of angels here, or these correspond to thousands of thousands of angels. Mispal Gadu Dechad. That's how one camp of angels has uh, perhaps 100,000 in the Milky Way. And uh, I'm just going to finish with this uh, that every star we read in Tehilim. That every star that God can count all the stars. We can't count the stars, but God can count all the stars and he gives them all names, that God counts all the stars and names them. And I'm just quoting Rabbi Arya Kaplan here, and this is a chart from his book from Sefer Yetzirah. If you do a permutation of all the letters, all the possible permutations of the Hebrew alphabet, you get 10 to the 21 permutations. That's the total number of names you can derive from the Hebrew alphabet. And what's amazing is that 10 to the 21 is the number of stars that's estimated in the universe by NASA. So it's, it, it just works out that every star really could have a name, a Hebrew name in the divine language. If you do every permutation possible of the Hebrew alphabet, you get 10 to the 21 possible names for each star of the universe. And last slide, I promise. So Amar Eish Lakish, that this is a very famous thing in, in the Gemara, that the Gemara tells us how many stars there are in the universe. Um, that God told the Jewish people, I created this many things. He says, I made Yud Bet Mazalot, I made 12 constellations, and I made Shloshim Chayil and 30 legions of stars, Ve'alkol Chayil barati lo Shloshim Ligion, you know, legions upon legions and Rahaton and different divisions and battalions of stars. God describes the stars, which are kind of related to the angels, uh, but God describes the stars the way he describes like legions of angels. And if you multiply what God says here, this many times, this many times, this many, how many stars there are per legion, per battalion, and so on, you get 10 to the power of 21 as well. And so that's, the Gemara already told us 2,000 years ago that there's 10 to the power of 21 stars, which is a, a huge number, an astronomical number, pardon the pun. And that, so that today NASA agrees with this number. If you look up the NASA estimate, that's how many stars they think there are in the universe. And what's amazing is God says, lo barati ela bishvilcha. I created all that for you, right? God created this universe for us. When we wonder why is the universe so vast? Why did God create all these stars and planets? God says, don't worry. I created it all for you, right? The Jewish people here actually complained to God and saying, you left us. You forgot us. And God says, no, 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 I didn't forget you. Don't worry. All of this whole universe I created for you. And a day will come when you're going to enjoy it 
uh, this is perhaps in our afterlife when we can go to the heavens and and the Gemara tells us that each righteous person in the afterlife has shy on a month, 310 worlds as a reward. So perhaps all these worlds out there, 10 to the power of 21 stars, there's plenty of worlds out there for each person to explore in the future, God willing, uh, in, in the coming time with the coming of Mashiach and the, and the world to come afterwards. Okay, and we'll end there. I uh, hope this was uh, enlightening a little bit and there's so much more to say, but I think that's enough for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And if there's questions, comments, we'll take them now.